Hello all, welcome back to ATM5, Our Changing Atmosphere. Today's lecture concerns strategies for tackling climate change, from mitigation to adaptation to geoengineering. In this section, we'll be defining mitigation, adaptation, geoengineering, adaptive capacity, and climate vulnerability. We'll be asking how are at mitigation and adaptation linked, and what are examples of mitigation, adaptation, and geoengineering? To begin, let's define these three strategies for tackling climate change. Formally, mitigation refers to actions aimed at limiting the magnitude of climate change. Adaptation refers to actions that are aimed at minimizing the impact of climate change. And geoengineering refers to the deliberate, large-scale manipulation of environmental processes that affect the Earth's climate in an attempt to counteract climate change. We'll be giving several examples of each of these uh, strategies in the remainder of this lecture. Mitigation and adaptation are inherently linked to one another in the sense that a failure to invest in mitigation activities means more needs to invest in adaptation later on. For instance, less mitigation at present means more greenhouse gases will be produced, leading to more serious climate change effects, greater impact on humans and the environment and consequently, more adaptation needed later. On the other hand, more aggressive mitigation activities at present leads to a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, less serious climate change effects, fewer impacts on humans and the environment, and so less need for adaptation later. Perhaps the most prominent example of mitigation activities at present is the recent Paris Climate Agreement which incorporates 195 countries and aims to set forth a framework for keeping global warming below 2 degrees Celsius. As is typical with such international agreements, it primarily consists of voluntary reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, coupled with a strategy for financing adaptation and mitigation efforts in developing countries. The three key provisions are holding the increase in global average temperatures below 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, recognizing that this would significantly reduce risk and impact from climate change, increasing the ability to adapt to adverse impacts of climate change and foster climate resilience, and a provision that is most relevant for advancing real progress on climate change, ensuring financing is available for low greenhouse gas emissions and climate resilient development. While the Paris Agreement is the strongest to date, the expected changes to the climate system in response to a two degree warming are still severe, and will push us to, into a regime unlike any we've experienced in human history. The hope is that as more advanced technologies arise and awareness of the effect of climate change grows, more aggressive measures will be taken to tackle climate change. Although most countries are making efforts to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, these actions are largely insufficient to meet the two degree warming target of the Paris Agreement. Without action, climate warming would be expected to be between 4.1 and 4.8 degrees Celsius. Current policies suggest that we are on target to instead hit between 2.8 and 3.2 degrees Celsius. And current pledges put us on target for 2.5 and 2.8 degrees Celsius. So there is a pressing need for more aggressive technological and policy initiatives to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. The Climate Data Tracker tracks efforts related to reducing greenhouse gas emissions by countries around the world and provides a scoring of those efforts relative to the target of the Paris Agreement. Most countries' efforts to date have been insufficient to meet these goals, although countries frequently address their individual climate plans. Certainly, more action is needed from some of the world's biggest polluters. Besides the Paris Agreement, many more regionalized policies have been adapted to draw down greenhouse emissions. In 2006, California committed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to 1990 levels by 2020 under Bill AB32. This objective was met four years early, in 2016. Currently, the state is pushing a reduction of greenhouse gas emissions to 40% below 1990 levels by 2030, and 80% below 1990 levels by 2050. It also has a goal of 100% carbon-free electricity by 2045, and economy-wide carbon neutrality by 2045. A third pillar of the California effort is the statewide cap-and-trade program which aims to limit greenhouse gas emissions from industry and develop a state exchange for buying and selling permits for emission of greenhouse gases. This is one of the largest multi-sectoral emissions trading systems in the world, with revenues deposited into the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, which has been used to implement programs for further offsetting greenhouse gas emissions. 
To learn more about California's efforts to achieve carbon neutrality, check out the link here to a recent report by the California Air Resources Board on how the state is planning to draw down carbon dioxide emissions. Europe also provides several examples of important mitigation efforts. Much like California, Europe has several pledges for a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Currently, Europe is targeting a reduction of emissions to 55% below 1990 levels by 2030 and carbon neutrality by 2050. France aims to ban all petrol and diesel vehicles from the road by 2040, no longer use coal to produce electricity after 2022, and invest up to 4 billion euro in boosting energy efficiency. The UK recently announced a move to end sales of non-electric cars by 2035. And simultaneously, the EU manages an emissions trading system known as the EU ETS that covers around 40% of the EU's greenhouse gas emissions. Many of these actions will require aggressive changes to the present economy in Europe. A key component of mitigation efforts is the switch to renewable and clean energy sources, including wind, solar, nuclear, hydroelectric, biofuels, and fossil fuels with carbon capture and storage. Wind power and solar panel power have known geographical and energy storage constraints, although wind and solar technologies are advancing rapidly. Nuclear power, which only emits water vapor into the atmosphere, is a good option to cover the issue of intermittency of wind and solar resources, although we have to deal with environmental issues related to nuclear waste storage and disposal. Hydroelectric power, where capacity exists, provides a clean alternative, although it is also known to have significant impacts on the local environment. However, hydroelectric power has already been installed in most regions where this form of power generation is feasible. Biofuels have been explored over the past several decades for producing ethanol. Because biofuels effectively draw carbon down directly from the atmosphere, their carbon impact is significantly less than fossil fuels extracted from underground. Finally, on the power generation front, significant investments have been made in installing carbon capture and storage technology on existing fossil fuel power plants. However, recent advances in renewable power have made such technologies largely uneconomical compared with renewable alternatives. Here at UC Davis, we have a couple examples of mitigation in action. The UC Davis anaerobic biodigester was opened in April 2014 in order to generate electricity from methane gas formed from the digestion of organic wastes. Effectively, compost and food waste is used by the biodigester to generate heat, which is harnessed for electricity generation. UC Davis is also host to the largest solar installation in the UC system and the largest behind the meter solar plant on, the, on a US, US college campus. However, the solar plant only covers around 9% of the total campus carbon footprint. Other technologies that are useful in mitigating the effect of greenhouse gas emissions include improved vehicle fuel efficiency, building code changes to improve energy efficiency, tree planting and care, noting that tree species need to be selected to be carbon negative, water conservation, green roofs, ecosystem and agricultural management, including reduction of deforestation and implementation of agricultural tillage in which straw and other agricultural byproducts are tilled into the soil to store carbon, carbon removal algae, carbon pumps and filters, and rainwater storage. Notably, many of these efforts are targeted at reducing energy demand, which in turn reduces our dependency on fossil fuels for electricity generation. One topic that often comes up in light of climate change mitigation is local food production and consumption. The idea being that carbon dioxide from food transport can be mitigated if only local produce is consumed. However, warehousing and transportation only accounts for approximately 17% of total greenhouse gas emissions related to agricultural products. Local food production can, be can also be associated with a larger carbon footprint because of local growing conditions or methods. That is, not to say that local food production and consum consumption doesn't have a range of other benefits, but one needs to think critically about the carbon footprint of particular types of foods. One past study, for instance, showed that lamb, apples, and dairy produced in New Zealand and shipped to the UK actually had a lower carbon footprint than locally produced foods. This was because New Zealand electricity derived from hydropower and less need for chemical fertilizers than UK counterparts. Together, these were enough to more than offset the carbon requirement from 11,000 miles of ocean shipping. Let's now turn our attention to adaptation. Recall, adaptation refers to actions that aim to minimize the impact of climate change. 
the greater amount of climate change experienced, the greater than anticipated impact, and so more adaptation needed to avoid the consequences. In the context of adaptation, we'll consider two concepts related to how easily a particular region can adapt to the changes wrought by climate change. First, adaptive capacity is a measure of the capacity and potential for humans in a particular region to adapt to changes in climate. Second, climate change vulnerability is a measure of the danger posed by climate change to a particular region. Intuitively, adaptive capacity is unevenly distributed across regions and populations, with underdeveloped and developing countries generally having less capacity to adapt. That is, these regions typically lack the infrastructure and governmental support that is, that is needed in order to adapt to climate change. Notably, specific definitions of adaptive capacity and climate change vulnerability vary throughout the literature. Different sources put greater weight on socioeconomic factors, political factors, extreme weather, access to resources and measures of the capacity of a particular population to adapt. Inevitably, adaptive capacity requires certain assumptions about how much effort or financing is available to pursue these adaptations to climate change. A number of efforts can be tackled at present to improve adaptive capacity and thus allow a population to be better prepared in the face of cli a changing climate. Some examples include improving infrastructure, for example, improving water resources management, or development of residential and health programs, such as more access to clean water in disadvantaged communities, improving resilience to extreme weather, developing cooling centers to provide shelter for populations in light of heat waves, and ensuring improved air quality. Adaptation also includes tackling disease and disease vectors such as mosquitoes, which are anticipated to thrive under warmer, wetter conditions. Other strategies include improving institutional capacity and efficiency in order to ensure financial and political mechanisms are available to ensure sufficient flexibility in tackling climate change, shifting agriculture to adapt to changes in temperature and precipitation, and the construction of reservoirs and water storage infrastructure to ensure water availability under increased climate variability. Nonetheless, in many low-lying areas, adaptation is simply not an option. Rising sea levels and land subsidence will simply drown existing infrastructure. In this case, migration becomes one possible option for adaptation. To give one such example, the Maldives is an island chain in the Indian Ocean, with 80% of its land less than three feet above sea level. In response, the government has sought buying up land in India, Sri Lanka, and Australia that could be used for relocation of the island's population. The third approach to dealing with climate change is geoengineering. This method involves large-scale intervention in the climate system that is aimed to reduce the impacts of climate change. A few such approaches are depicted here, including injection of aerosols into the stratosphere, orbital reflectors, chemicals to enhance ozone production, cloud seeding, afforestation, genetically engineered crops, greening deserts, iron fertilization in the ocean, and carbon sequestration. Notably, carbon capture at source is generally considered a mitigation technology, whereas carbon capture from the air is considered geoengineering. Geoengineering, as a strategy, is generally viewed not so much as a long-term solution, but more as a means to buy us the needed time to cut down on our dependence on fossil fuels. This comprehensive assessment by the Royal Society provides a depiction of the affordability of these solutions versus their effectiveness. The most affordable solutions are found to the right, the most effective solutions towards the top. The colored dots indicate the relative safety of these measures, with colors, while the size of the dot indicates the timeliness of the solution. Some of the most promising options include stratospheric aerosols, afforestation, and carbon dioxide capture. On the other end of the scale are modifications to surface albedo, effectively repainting the planetary surface, which may have some effect, but are generally highly unaffordable. Let's talk about a couple of the more promising options briefly. Stratospheric seeding of aerosols is one of the most well-known geoengineering concepts, in part because of conspiratorial fears about what governments are putting into the air. However, only localized seeding experiments have been performed to date, with expected results. This strategy aims to inject aerosols into the stratosphere that would behave the way most aerosols do, reflecting incoming solar radiation back to space and increasing planetary albedo. The result would be less solar radiation, 
and so cooler surface temperatures even under higher greenhouse gas concentrations. Injection into the stratosphere uh, is a key component of this strategy because of the relative stability of the stratosphere, meaning that the aerosols would take many months to be finally removed. This strategy is also one of the most well known because it is feasible with present day technology, either via balloons or aircraft. Nonetheless, there are some side effects to this approach, including reduction of light reaching the planetary surface, which will have negative consequences for ecosystems, as well as a reduction in the productivity of existing solar installations. Also, there are unknown health effects associated with aerosols that sink into the troposphere, as well as a potential reduction in ozone because of chemical reactions involving these aerosols. Another option that accomplishes this effective aerosol injection without the potential health risks is the deployment of a solar sun shade. Perhaps surprisingly, this is an option uh, even with present day technology, but one that would take a decade to implement. The idea would be to deploy a large sun shade close to the sun that would absorb some of the sunlight destined for the earth. Again, this would reduce incoming solar radiation and so cool the planet. However, the same issues with light deprivation would still hold. A third geoengineering solution is ocean iron fertilization. This strategy would involve dumping iron filings into the near surface ocean in certain regions of the ocean, whose local ecology is iron limited. This would drive a rapid phytoplankton bloom, which would draw carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. When the phytoplankton died, they would sink to the bottom of the ocean and effectively sequester the carbon. Studies are ongoing on the potential magnitude of this effect and the dangers that remain for ocean ecosystems. I'd like to wrap up today's lecture with the geoengineering solution that I think is most essential for combating climate change. Put simply, carbon capture is a means of cleaning up our mess, either by capturing carbon dioxide before it gets into the atmosphere, or by removing carbon dioxide that is already in the atmosphere. Carbon captured in such a manner can either be sequestered or utilized, the former referring to placing carbon underground in deep geological formations to prevent leakage, and the latter referring to con conversion of carbon for use in fuels, chemical synthesis, or algae cultivation. Carbon can be captured at the source either as a modification to existing power plants or drawn from the air. An example of capture at the source is shown in the upper image here at the Net Power Facility in Laporte, Texas, which uses a power cycle that generates almost pure carbon dioxide that can be readily captured. An example of capture from the air is shown in the bottom here at the Climeworks Direct Carbon Capture Plant in Switzerland, where CO2 is pulled from ambient air. Nonetheless, these technologies are presently very expensive and difficult to scale to the needed capacity to offset global emissions. Nonetheless, the hope is that with newer technologies and investments in science and engineering, we will be able to more efficiently extract carbon from the atmosphere. There is a need for net negative carbon emissions if we want to avoid the most significant impacts of climate change, and so technologies such as these are essential for mitigation. All right, thanks everybody for joining me today. Only one lecture left in this series, where we'll finally wrap up on addressing some of the impacts from climate change.